where three tectonic plates meet below the ocean. Volcanoes emerged from the depths to create the Azorean island chain. The archipelago would be slowly populated with flora, as the islands were visited by birds who often left seeds from their food sources on the mainland. Eventually, stars guided ancient sailors through the Atlantic. These unknown Mediterranean people would land on the Azores Islands and make them their home. They built Hypogea in what is today known as Monche Brasil, and there are many theories as to who these people were. There are leanings towards the people that lived in Mallorca due to the style of buildings that they left behind. These hypogea suggest an occupation, and not solely a visit, due to the time and effort needed to build these structures, but somehow, these people would eventually disappear from the Azores. Tales of these islands may have reached the Hellenic states from these mysterious Mediterraneans, as we hear ancient Greek philosophers believed that legendary heroes in the afterlife would be rewarded for their lives on Earth by being allowed to live on the islands of the blessed. For the Greeks, these islands were located beyond the Pillars of Hercules, now known as the Strait of Gibraltar, in the River Oceanus, which was the outer boundary of the world as the Greeks understood it at the time. Some say that these myths were in reference to the Azores Islands, but could have been in reference to any islands of Macaronesia, if they were truly in reference to a physical body of land. It wouldn't be for another several hundred years before humans once again found these islands. Norsemen, probably from Norway, using their unparalleled naval capabilities in Europe, located the Azorean Archipelago. Here, Vikings established substantial colonies and cleared spaces of trees to allow for increased grazing land for their livestock and fuel for their fires. This is a very new discovery, so not much is known about their impact on the islands, but we can assume that they had some sort of settlement attempt with evidence of sheep and cows. Why these Vikings abandoned their island home is yet unknown, but they were here for long enough to leave minor traces of their settlement on the islands. The Azores fell into obscurity for a time, but it can be assumed that tales of the islands in the Atlantic reached the European mainland and inspired some to explore westward. Iberian fishers and sailors most likely visited the islands regularly enough that tales of the islands became widely known and accepted. We don't know who did so, but expeditions by Christian nations would follow, mapping the Azores as well. Early written documents of the islands during this time are very unclear leading some to believe that during this period, there may have been times where the islands were briefly inhabited. This could also be in reference to ancient Viking settlements, fishing outposts, or even just myths about the islands getting carried away. Whatever the case, by the time the Portuguese had been forced by many factors to turn their attention to the Atlantic in search of their fortunes, the Azores were uninhabited. Portuguese explorers knew of the islands due to the routes they sailed coming home from expeditions along the African coast taking them past the islands of Macaronesia. These islands in the Atlantic were perfect spots to rest and resupply their ships. Officially though, the islands weren't discovered until after the colonization of Madeira. The colonization of Madeira is very important in Azorean history, as success seen in this colony incentivized other explorers and colonists to turn their attention to the Azores. This is where we see the official discovery of the archipelago by Diogo de Chilves, who reached most of the islands on his expeditions. More inconvenient to travel to than Madeira, settlement here took a sluggish start, with Gonçal Vel Cabral landing on several islands, naming one Santa Maria, and claiming the island chain for the crown of Portugal. Cabral would return to mainland Europe, where he would be named the captain of Santa Maria by Queen Isabel, and with this title, he returned to administer and colonize his island. His group of colonists brought with them livestock, and they established the first Portuguese settlement, called Anjos. Prince Henry the Navigator ordered Cabral to release cows and sheep on unpopulated islands, as he knew that they would be colonized soon, and having established populations of these animals would make the future endeavor much easier. During this mission, the island of São Miguel was colonized, with Povoa São Vela being the first settlement. Early colonists had to fight an uphill battle, as despite the fertile volcanic soil being perfect for agriculture, the colonists had to deforest a lot of land and find areas in the uneven terrain flat enough to allow for agriculture. Very soon, promotion of Azorian settlement was propagated, and it seemed to have worked, with settled islands seeing the rise of new towns, while colonization efforts spread through the archipelago to new islands. With Portuguese and Spanish rivalries flaring up over the successor to the Spanish throne, the Azores were prone to Spanish raids and pirates. 
One such raid conducted on Vila do Porto captured the captain of the islands, Joao Soares de Albelgaria, and ransomed him back to the Portuguese. But in spite of the raids, Azorian settlements would grow, and wheat became an important commodity produced by the colonists, with year after year of fantastic harvests. Christopher Columbus sailed the oceans for the Spanish, learning of the New World. Now, on his return voyage, Columbus and his crew spotted land. Unsure if this was Madeira, the Canary Islands, or the Azores, some crew were sent ashore, and were met with the friendly locals of Santa Maria, who explained where they were. More of the crew were enticed ashore to attend a mass the next day, but they would be detained by the captain of the islands, and a group of locals. After a short period of negotiations with Columbus, and interrogation of the hostages, the detained crew were returned, probably because they held no significant value to the islanders, and the Spanish expedition would be sent off. The return of Columbus to Spain began a new age of colonization, which truly changed the fortunes of Azorians, who previously experienced a meager growth in settlements. Portuguese ships loaded with colonial goods began using the Azores as a port of call to resupply, rest, and repair their ships. The island of Terceira saw the largest boon from the flow of goods from the New World, Africa, and Asia to Portugal, which can be seen as despite the relatively small population of the island, many fortifications were established to defend the important commercial ports. Much was invested in the establishment and expansion of defenses throughout the archipelago, which came at the perfect time. Enemies of the Portuguese also understood the significance of the Azores, and hoped to both cripple Portuguese trade capabilities and take the profitable islands for themselves through naval attacks. As well, piracy continued to be rampant within the archipelago. Meanwhile in Portugal, the king had died without an heir. Antonio, prior of Crato, claimed the throne, while Spain marched their army into Portugal to establish their king, Felipe II, upon the throne. In the face of an invasion of the largest army in Europe, Antonio fled Portugal to Terceira. Waiting for the Spanish to attack, Antonio mustered what he could to form a defense force with locals, being bolstered by troops and ships from France and other allies. The Spanish, expecting little resistance and for many to desert, landed at the Bay of Salga, where the islanders fought bravely and were able to push the Spanish back with the help of bulls that they let loose into the Spanish ranks, causing confusion and disarray. After a brief retreat, the Spanish would return, destroying a French fleet defending the islands. The Spanish didn't land, since this attack was primarily to destroy the naval forces of the islands, and they now returned with an invasion force to occupy the islands. Defenses of Terceira were manned, but they were manned in the wrong places, and the Portuguese were caught off guard by the location of the Spanish landing. Although fighting occurred, the battle was swift, with many Portuguese fleeing into the mountains. The Azores were conquered, but anti-Spanish sentiments continued to permeate due to the harsh treatment given to prisoners of war, which included public hanging. The Azorian focus now returned to being a transit point in colonial trade. It could be said that the Spanish improved the lives of the elites on the islands, as now, goods from basically the entire continent of South America would stop there. English, French, and Dutch ships were the primary source of piracy and raiding in the Azores during this period of time, since these nations supported the Portuguese, and opposed the Spanish. There was also a short, week-long occupation of the island of Santa Maria by Moors, who were raiding for captives. To defend the islands, the fortress of São João Baptista was built, and when finished, was the largest fortress built by Spain beyond continental Europe. As well, to support the military occupation, one of the first ever military hospitals was established. After years of conflict on the mainland, the Portuguese king was returned to the throne. Once this news had reached the Azores, the people were elated and took to the streets, where they forced the Spanish troops into the fortress of São João Baptista. But those Spanish that were garrisoning the Azores weren't going to give in that easily. A protracted siege would ensue, with other islands sending reinforcements to Terceira to aid in the siege, and the Spanish frequently firing upon the city that they overlooked. Eventually, though, the Spanish would be forced to capitulate, and they were allowed to leave the Azores in peace. The Portuguese felt that their empire was barely holding together, and monarchs began implementing liberal reforms to their lands in hopes to unify them beneath the Portuguese crown. Up until this point, each island in the Azores archipelago had their own captain. However, once the liberal reforms were passed, the Azores officially became one political entity with a single captain who would govern out of the newly named capital of the Azores, Angra, 
With this restructuring of the political scene, came a wave of support on the islands for the liberal style of rule. Meanwhile, the king had fled to Brazil in the wake of the Napoleonic invasion of the mainland, and the Azores went through a period of identity crisis due to a shift in trade. Their purpose was found in being a forward base for Portuguese monarchs and their allies to attack the French in Iberia. While the Portuguese crown experienced turmoil with Brazil and the re-establishment of the Portuguese crown on the mainland, the Azores Islands saw long-lasting political isolation that shaped the islands as more independent and headstrong. This is exemplified in a quote by an Azorean judge when asked to join the liberal revolution in Portugal. The Azores form a captaincy and a political government entirely separate from Portugal. Our relations with the kingdom are friendly, commercial, and judicial. And in these aspects, there has been no change at all, because ships bring here as before sentences and papers of the same sort in the name of the king, and therefore we must understand, as it seems to me, that Portugal seems itself in relation to the Azores as before. Despite the hesitancy to join in the revolution, the liberal leanings of the island's inhabitants meant that the constitution that came from this revolution was widely embraced, to the extent that when the liberal monarch Maria II was deposed, the Azorians deposed their captain, a supporter of Maria's rival, and installed Antonio José Cerevim de Noronha instead. This new captain would defend the islands from an attack at the Battle of Praia, and in the wake of this victory, Angra was renamed Angra do Heroismo for its valor in this battle. Maria had fled to these islands, and until her reinstatement upon the Portuguese throne, Angra do Heroismo was considered the capital of Portugal. Unfortunately, this seems to have been the beginning of the end of the Azorean Golden Age, as now with an independent Brazil and improvements to sailing, the islands gradually lost their importance in trade. Militarily though, the islands regained significance, as both Germany and the United States desired the Azores during the First World War. Germany even thought about an invasion of the US from the Azores. Von Ruder, a German general, is quoted in saying, if Germany had had possession of the Azores, she would have won the war. Instead, Portugal joined the war against Germany, and the US was allowed to use the islands as a military base, from which they conducted anti-U-boat missions and harbored American ships, planes, and soldiers. After a coup on the mainland that established a dictator, the island of Madeira revolted, and the Azores joined them, hoping to preserve democracy. But the Azorians would be forced to capitulate in the face of military reprisals. During the Second World War, Portugal maintained an uneasy neutrality, and in the case of an invasion, the government was prepared to move operations to the Azores. Also, because of the demonstrated benefit that the Azores afforded to the Entente powers during the First World War, the US, Germany, and Britain all had plans to occupy the islands. Fortunately, neither of those worst case scenarios occurred. As Germany became distracted with the USSR, the North African campaign saw success, and the Azores were allowed to be used as a base of operations in the Atlantic for Britain and the USA. Once the war was over, the islands shifted their focus to a new tourist industry. An Azorian independence movement grew in response to a military coup in Portugal, from which many feared a communist government would ensue. The Azorian Liberation Front headed this independence struggle for a time, before many of their supporters were pacified by a return to democracy and the allocation of the islands as an autonomous region of Portugal, allowing increased autonomy. The islands would grow to become a very popular tourist destination, being colloquially known as Europe's Hawaii, and they remain part of Portugal until today. And that was the Azores highlighted. Please like and subscribe if you liked the video, and if you have any suggestions or comments, leave them in the comment section below, or email me with my email in the description. I also started a Patreon if anyone is interested in supporting a small creator like myself. Um.